newborn baby boy has been found dead near Cahasavin in County Kerry. Its neck had been broken, stabbed 28 times. It has always lingered who would have given an innocent child multiple stab wounds and left it on a, on a seashore. That began a chain of events that became one of the most extraordinary and distressing sagas in modern Irish history. This was the very determined guard operation, and they were going to catch whoever it was. Of course, the question is, who killed this baby on the beach? On the night of May the 1st, Joanne was charged with murder. Her sister, brothers and aunt were charged with concealment of birth. And that's where tragedy, in some respects, turned to farce. The forensics did not support the Garda story. What went on behind those closed doors? They had such a strong sense that we cannot be found out. We were just good, honest detectives. We would not give up. I was crying the whole time. They really frightened me. And eventually, they start describing this case as crazy. She was being torn to shreds. There is a baby at the centre of this case who was stabbed 28 times. Today, one of Ireland's greatest mysteries is again in the headlines. This was a story that played out over decades rather than years. Uh, everybody was talking about the case in 84. Mr Hayes, we have no comment to make. Will the, will the angels go on? We have no comment to make. And everybody's still talking about the case in 2023. Now, let's go to some news that's just breaking this evening. And two people, a man in his 60s and a woman in her 50s, have been arrested by Gardaí investigating the so-called Kerry Babies case. It's a beautiful place. It's right at the heart of the Ring of Kerry, famous tourist route. It's a small place and it's quite a dispersed population. It was an area where tourism had yet to develop, so it was quite insular. It was a population of approximately 1,300 people. It was an area of very low crime as well. I mean, very little would have happened back then the kind of place where everybody knows everybody else and their business. A newborn baby boy has been found dead near Cahasavine in County Kerry. The baby is believed to have died about three days ago and a post-mortem is being carried out by the state pathologist, Dr. John Harbison. Normally, Sunday's quite news day. Nothing much happens on the Sunday, at that time anyway. So the phone rang, and I knew straight away there was something up, because you'd rarely get a phone call to do with work on a Sunday. A good contact of mine from the Carcevian area was on the line. And he said, uh, Donald, there's a story here. A man running the beach last night, a man called Jack Griffin, came upon the body of a newly born baby. And an investigation is underway. So we're off to the White Strand where the baby was found. It's a beautiful location, despite the very obviously dark history, but it's a lovely, lovely beach. The baby was found at the far side of the White Strand on the rocks. As Jack came closer, he wasn't even sure it was a baby. He couldn't quite see what it was. It was also quite dark at the time. I mean, this is the spot now, looking at it almost 40 years later, a very desolate area. He went to get his brother-in-law, Brendan O'Shea, and both of them returned here to the beach on the White Strand. And they went closer and realised this was indeed a baby, as Jack had first thought. 
This baby had met a very violent death, stabbed a number of times in the chest and neck. Lying nearby were a sack and a bag, and it looked as though the body was maybe initially inside. An obviously distressing, appalling situation. The Gardaí arrived to the scene, and Tom Conan, who was a local undertaker, was here with the local guards, and he uh, picked up the baby and removed it, and he christened the baby right here on the beach. Kind of symbolic of Ireland at the time. And they called him Baby John. I got word that a baby had been found on the beach, and Sergeant Paddy Reedy was the sergeant whom I knew, but I heard he was in the hospital in Killarney waiting for John Harbison, the state pathologist, to come and examine the baby. The horror of what had happened and what was to continue, it was hard to reconcile it with that quiet meeting with the sergeant. The post-mortem revealed that the baby washed up on the beach in Carasobine had been stabbed 28 times. Its neck had been broken. And this led to an inquiry as to who was the mother of this baby? Where was it born? How did it end up on a beach in Carasobine? With the results of the autopsy, and we know that the baby suffered a gruesome death, now it becomes even a bigger case. This news is starting to filter through in the community while a dead body was one thing. Now we have a dead, murdered baby. I got my story confirmed from the guards and all that, and I filed my story for the following morning's paper. The state of the child upset people deeply. There was some idea that this child was washed up out of a ship or was thrown there. Some of that may have been a resistance that this could not be somebody local doing this. Of course, the question is, who killed this baby on the beach? The investigation starts that I kept tabs on it every day, then you do follow up every day. Make a phone call to the guards, any developments, how are things going, the usual routine work of a reporter. I gathered from my initial contacts with the guards that they thought it had to be local, a local suspect. And of course, that was the focus of the investigation straight away, the Carsevine area. The police descend on Carras Ivine and begin what really amounts to a sexual profiling of the town to find out who could have been the mother of this dead baby. The focus was on women and young women, women of childbearing age, and any kind of sexual aberration would have been of the time, in terms of the time, would have been very much focused on. So there was quite an intrusion into the intimate lives of the whole town, really, in Carter Savine. So we're getting calls from a neighbour who might report a young woman next door who they thought had been pregnant. Literally nasty calls, untrue. There were some girls who had put on weight who had not. I heard one or two girls who had gone and had an abortion in England, but his parents didn't know about it. And when the guards came, the consternation at a family level was huge. I mean, how awful is that on, on so many different levels? The shame and the judgment and the persecution that was imposed on women and girls who did become pregnant out of sight of wedlock. And that was all promoted by the Catholic Church, which said that this was a sin and that anyone who got pregnant outside of wedlock should be a penitent. They were still seen as so-called fallen women. They were still persecuted. They were still marginalized. 
that phrase, fallen women, is one that permeates modern Irish history. You don't get the same emphasis on fallen men. Obviously, these women who get pregnant outside of marriage don't get pregnant on their own. But to listen to the way in which these women are referred to, you could come to the conclusion that they got pregnant on their own. The emphasis is very much gendered. It's on the fallen woman. You had the state law backing up really what the pulpit said about loose women and loose behaviour. Under the High Court ruling of a year ago, the two agencies which had been offering counselling or referral services to clinics in Britain have either closed or discontinued their service. The Defend the Clinics campaign say this has left Irish women with nowhere to turn for help or advice, despite what they say is an obvious demand. The pinnacle of this really is the introduction of the Eighth Amendment of our Constitution, which effectively was a constitutional ban on abortion and which made the life of the mother equal to that of a fetus. And you had activists at the time, feminist activists, warning that this would endanger the lives of women and girls. That was only months before this baby on White Strand was conceived. It was incredibly divisive, incredibly uh, intrusive and incredibly hurtful to women and really made young women of the time, and I was a young woman at the time, made them feel terrible. I mean, it, 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 it brandished and isolated and alerted them to consequences. to understanding Ireland in the early 1980s is shame and stigma. Ireland did not do crisis pregnancy well. A very famous case in Ireland during this period as well was the case of Anne Lovett, who was a 15-year-old schoolgirl who died in childbirth in Granard in County Longford. It had been noticed that she was pregnant, but clearly nobody actually reached out to that young girl and said, can we help you? We want to help you. Eventually, she must have been in a state of intense despair, distress, maybe pain, awful emotional suffering. She went to visit a local grotto to the Virgin Mary just outside the town. She died in a grotto giving birth to her stillborn child. And, of course, the whole town closed in around that whole incident and nothing was said. And it was only some years later, many years later, that it was discovered that her own young sister committed suicide two or three months after Anne Lovett's terrible, lonely, awful death at the grotto. There are agreed silences. There was sometimes an unwritten rule that is not going to be talked about because it's too difficult. Given the stigma and the taboo around pregnancy outside of marriage, it's not surprising that desperate young women resorted to these drastic measures to try and get rid of that stigma. The investigation continued for a couple of weeks. After a while, it became clear that they were turning up nothing in Car Sabine. It was a very rural station. Car Sabine did not have many guards and probably very few equipped to deal with such a huge investigation. You've got to remember, of course, that local guards would have been very knitted in to the local community, and that would have created complications in relation to investigating a matter of this nature. Like everything else then, after about a week or so, the media sorts of loses interest. The guards are still doing their work on the ground, but there's no development. And then it took a major turn. They found out that a woman came to the hospital uh, who, in the view of medical staff, had given birth, but there was no baby.
the investigation was going nowhere fast. It just so happened, just one of these coincidences, that Detective Superintendent John Courtney, head of the investigative section of the Garda Technical Bureau, was on holidays in Kerry and got talking to some of the local Garda investigating the discovery of the, the, the infant's body. I knew John well. We worked together in the Central Detective Unit. He was an extraordinary man. He devoted his life into service of the people. He was absolutely determined, dogged, obstinate, of course he was, and uh, as all good detectives should be. He was really a unique type of individual. Courtney was big stuff at that time, and Courtney and the people with him would yield results. He had joined the detective branch at a very early stage and he had a good track record. When a serious crime would occur in a particular part of the country, the technical bureau would be sent down, an investigation team. So a, a team of up to maybe 10 experienced, case-hardened detectives would arrive into perhaps a country area and they were there in theory to augment and to support the local superintendent and his team. But of course, in practice, what often happened was that they took over. And this is what happened in Kerry. This was a very determined guard operation. And they were going to catch whoever it was. One of the big questions was the appropriateness of those individuals conducting this investigation. They were all guards, but they did specialize in a particular type of policing. Whereas what they were dealing with in Kerry was something entirely different. It was a detective sent by John Courtney to Kerry who established a list of three women in the Tralee area that had not yet been investigated by the Carsevine Gardaí. Two of those women checked out. They had recently been pregnant, had given birth, and their infant was with the mother. So two women off the list. The third person on the list was Joanne Hayes, a young, single, 25-year-old farmer's daughter from Abbey Dorney. She was quickly identified as a suspect. She presented herself um, to the hospital in Tralee as having suffered a miscarriage, but the staff were aware that she, this was a woman who had given birth. But the circus quickly moved up to Abbey Dorney and left Cahar Savine. That began a chain of events that became one of the most extraordinary and distressing sagas in modern Irish history. And what it did in the 1980s was blow open an issue when it comes to pregnancy, the concealing of pregnancy or the attempted concealing of pregnancy that historically had been very common, but around which there was so much silence. Joanna Hayes was 25 and she was from Abbey Dorney where she lived with her family. She is from a very traditional rural setup, the family farm. They made good contribution to the community, well regarded. This incident emerged like a bolt out of the blue. Abbey Dorney, where the Hayes family lived, is a typical small village in Kerry. It has a pub, a shop, a church, a priest, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and that's that's where she grew up. She was part of that community. But she also works in Tralee. She works in a sports centre. She meets a man who's also working there, Jeremiah Locke. They begin a relationship. He is married, but they begin a relationship. Joanne has a daughter from that relationship. Joanne Hayes was hoping, it appears, that Jeremiah Locke would leave his wife and live happily ever after with Joanne. That was never to happen. The fact that Joanne had a baby outside marriage was not so shocking. This was happening all around the country. 
What was really interesting was the fact that her family embraced her, that she remained at home. That, I think, was actually, to some extent, quite unusual. Families can make their own decisions in relation to what they feel is best for their daughter and for what might be their granddaughter, and that it would be better for them to be brought up in a family environment, in a home where there is extended family support. And the Hayes seem to have come to that arrangement themselves. But it also, of course, becomes complicated as a result of the relationship that she is in. Joanna resumes the relationship with Jeremiah Locke and she becomes pregnant again. He has one child with his wife. He has one child with Joanne. And at that stage, she learns that Jeremiah's wife is also pregnant, and this causes uh, an amount of distress and disharmony uh, in the relationship and causes harsh words to be spoken between Joanne and Mrs. Locke. It would seem to me from the sort of evidence that came out that Joanne, I don't know if she didn't want this baby, but she was certainly unhappy uh, uh, at the situation she now found herself in. She had hoped that she and Jeremiah would have a future together, presumably uh, uh, an open future as, 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 as man and wife. I think once she learned that Jeremiah's wife was pregnant also, she realized that that was not going to happen. It would have been quite unusual at the time that a young woman from a very conservative background in Abbey Dorney, respected family, would have been conducting this affair with a, a married man. It fitted the story of the type of woman the Gardaí suspected might be involved. A loose woman for the time, and the farming background, the fertilizer bag, she becomes the chief suspect in the case. When she became pregnant with Yvonne, her first baby, there wasn't any sense of her being ashamed. It was like as if, OK, she was caught offside. It was when she became pregnant the second time that that forgiveness went out the door. The question then is, to what extent were they living in denial in the Hayes family? They may have had suspected that she was pregnant, but nobody said anything. And suddenly, when the baby starts to be born, all hell breaks loose. It's not entirely clear what happens next. Joanne gives birth either in a room in the house or outside the house. That child does not survive. She is then bleeding and is in a distressed state. Uh, at some stage, goes to the hospital in Tralee. She says, I had a miscarriage, and the medical staff don't really believe that. They think, actually, what happened here was a full-term birth. But there's not a lot they can do uh, about the situation other than medically look after her, which they do, and she then leaves. Here we had a woman who appeared to have given birth but had no baby, and here we had a baby in Carcevine with no mother. Was this too much of a coincidence? I got briefed that possibly this is the culprit that Joanne was the mother of this baby in Car City. That was washed to show. John Courtney said we're bringing the family, invite him in the morning. The whole family. She 
She was arrested approximately two weeks after baby John was found. All her family were arrested and questioned. So her two brothers are also Ned and Michael, and her sister Kathleen, and her aunt Brody Fuller as well. And all of them were questioned for several, several hours, in fact, overnight, and it was a very intense questioning. I was working at the time. They came up at 12 o'clock on Tuesday, the 1st of May, and they asked me would I go down to the station for, question, for a few questions, so I said I would. And when I went to the guard station, I saw Ned and Mike being brought in as well. Were you questioned together or separately? No, separately all the time. We didn't see each other at all. I was assigned to interview Joanne. I was also with Detective P.J. Brown. This young, little petite, young woman, very fragile and looked very vulnerable and frightened as well. She could have been, you know, anyone's daughter. Throughout the afternoon, Joanne told Garthy she had given birth alone, standing up in a field. She said she panicked, put the baby on some hay, and went back into the house. She did not return to the baby until the following morning. It was dead. I said, uh, where is the baby? She said, uh, I tell you, I flushed it down the septic tank. Now we say we're getting somewhere, Joanne. But I said, I hope that's the truth, because as soon as I go down, we'll have a, a machine out to the tank in your house. We're going to drain the tank, and the baby's going to be there. Isn't it, Sean? Within, I don't know how long, she said, no, I didn't, it's not in the tank. I did not, I told you a lie, Jerry. Joanne said, I'll tell you where the baby is, Jerry. The truth, no lies. She said, I put the baby into a brown bag and I put it in, there's a pond of water there. She said, that's where the baby is. I went down to John Courtney. I said, Joanne Hayes has made an admission. Here's the map that she drew for us, a diagram. There's a baby out in the land, in a brown bag, and that's where you'll find. He looked at me and he, I can't, I must say, he wasn't convinced. There was a lacklustre approach to the search of the farm initially because they felt they had their woman. They were prevailed upon to go out and at least check was she telling the truth. First search party came back and they came up to the room where I was with Joanne and they said, there's no baby there. And at that, of course, Joanne got distraught. I went down to Superintendent and Courtney again, and I said, listen, whatever you say, that girl is telling me the truth up there. The difficulty was that from a very early point, it's now clear that the Gardaí had formed an opinion and were unwilling, or perhaps even unable, to move off that as their prime target. And so therefore, when those searches revealed nothing, well, it reinforced their own position at any rate. The interviews, stroke interrogations continued at Tralee Garda Station. And what arose from that was a series of confessions that have been always disputed and contested by the Hayes family. They had made 
government involvement, essentially in the uh, killing of the uh, baby found in White Strand, 70 or 80 miles away. The Hayes family confesses to Joanne beating the baby with a back brush and stabbing it. Supposedly wrapping it in a newspaper, putting it into several bags, putting it into a fertilizer bag, and that this was then driven to a sleigh head on the Dinkel Peninsula thrown into the sea, whereupon afterwards then it was supposedly washed up on White Strand Beach in Carslevine and found. This is a very neat confession because the baby in Carslevine was found in a fertiliser bag, so there you have it. All the inns were tying up. Bridie Fuller was the aunt of Joanne Hayes, and she was a nurse, and she was living um, with the Hayes family at the time. She said, I delivered the child. I delivered the baby in the room. Two detectives brought in a bat brush and a long knife with a brown handle. And they said that they had come upstairs from her family and they had said, this is the weapons that Joanne had killed her baby with. Joanne's statement. I went back to the bedroom and I hit the baby on the head with the bath brush. I had to kill him because of the shame it was going to bring on the family and because Jeremiah Locke would not run away and live with me. The baby cried when I hit it and I stabbed it with a carving knife on the chest and all over the body. I turned the baby over and I also stabbed him in the back. The baby stopped crying after I stabbed it. There was blood everywhere on the bed and there was also blood on the floor. When the body of the baby was found at Cahersavine, I knew deep down it was my baby. I was going to call him Shane. I am awfully sorry for what happened. May God forgive me. I have read the statement over to me and it is correct. I don't want to change any of it. Now the police said that was a genuine statement freely given by Joanne Hayes. On the night of May the 1st, Joanne was charged with murder. Her sister, brothers and aunt were charged with concealment of birth. The guards have put their two and two together, Joanne and the baby on the beach, and now they've got a confession from Joanne to that effect. Case solved, as they see it. And then everything changed again. In 1979, I came here first, because I just qualified that year. I was going to the local municipal swimming area uh, further over the town, and I met Joanne Hayes there. She worked in the reception. We became very familiar with each other. They had their own family solicitor at the time who did all their conveyancing work for them and to know who to transfer the farm and all that. But Joanne, Joanne sort of, I suppose, maybe she saw me as being belonging to the, to the different side of the, the legal business. Cases like petty assaults, small bit of public order, maybe a bit of thievery, and she insisted on me being the person she wanted to contact. One Wednesday morning, I was going down to court, which is just across the street. And I was making my way up the steps when somebody said to me that Joanne Hayes was looking for me in a room further down one of the consultation rooms. And I went in and she was there in the presence of a vanguard and she was sobbing. She said to me, they're saying that, you know, that I killed my baby. 
and uh, she had a charge sheet in her hand showing that she was charged with the offence of murder, the most serious uh, offence in the statute book. I would have known from court procedure that if she had a charge sheet in her hand that we were going to be in court in the next 15 minutes. And I would also have known that the district court doesn't have power to grant bail to somebody who's charged with that offence. So I, I asked Joanne, I said, well, what, are, I, what about the lads, you know, the rest of the family? Oh, she says, they're all charged as well. I couldn't believe it. I arrived at the court and I had got wind of the charges that were going to be made, as, as did other people in the media. So there was a big and unusually large media presence that morning because obviously anticipating this. Crime wasn't that common in the south of Ireland, and now here we have a scary woman arrested for murder. There was a bit of a flurry, I thought, around the courtroom. I remember Pat Mann in particular being very busy that morning. You could see he was very preoccupied with something. You could see that it was totally alien to them. It was probably the first time they ever sat in a court, I would imagine. They certainly looked very frightened and intimidated by the whole thing. That was the impression I got that day. I gathered all the charges together. We went into court. The state indicated there was no objection to bail for the family. But, of course, bail couldn't be granted to somebody charged with murder. So Joanne was remanded in custody to Limerick Prison, which is the local women's prison for this area. The people in Abbey Dormies were saying to me, for God's sake, this is completely ridiculous. This is, this is not on at all. They were seen locally as a gentle, inoffensive family who would not be capable of anything like that. Everyone who knew, they were well-respected people. Who had, who had never had anything against them in terms of violence or assault or anything like that. They were just very, very ordinary, decent people, people that you would love to be able to say you were, they were acquaintances and friends of yours. That was unique in my opinion because we, it was an era when there was shame. There was shame, there was scandal on a young girl getting pregnant outside marriage. Joanne had said to me, would you ever get Kathleen before I go? I need to talk to her for a second. So I got Kathleen. Joanne had told her sister, Kathleen, exactly where she had put the baby's body on the family farm in a pool of water. I said, if you see anything, don't touch anything, but call me. Things developed pretty dramatically that day. Kathleen knows that if she can find the body of Joanne's baby on the farm, as Joanne said, that this will prove to the guards that Joanne could not have murdered the Cahar Sabine baby. She searches, takes them time. They don't find it initially. she and the rest of the family, in due course, find the body of Joanne's baby on the farm. I got a phone call, the old big black heavy telephone, telling me, that they think they saw something in the ditch. I said, leave it, don't do a thing about it, stay there with it in case anything happens it. And I rang the local uh, guardie who'd been in charge of the case. I told them they walked down the field, because I've seen the photographs, obviously there were exhibits in the case, and clear they're pointing at something that was in the ditch, a plastic bag. Joanne is found to have been telling the truth. Her child was stillborn and was buried in the f farm in Abbey Dorney. The body of a second baby boy was found on the Hayes farm. It was in the exact spot described by Joanne to detectives the previous afternoon. 
The body had started to decompose. The cause of death was unascertainable, but there was no evidence of strangulation. She had nothing to do with the baby in cars, I mean. Now you had a situation where there appears to be two cases of infanticide. It's obviously a very serious matter, and it's a very distressing matter, but it becomes elevated into something more. It changed the whole case. The bottom fell out of the case. And the guards, of course, were completely startled by this because they didn't believe her at all from the start. Now we have a second baby, exactly as Joanna had said, yet we have a signed confession from the same woman saying she killed the baby and her brothers disposed of it and it ended up in the White Strand in Carcevine. So where did this story come from? Was it forced out of the Hayes family members? Were they intimidated and scared into making false confessions? Why were they identical in detail? These were the complicated questions then arising out of the interrogation of the Hayes family. Now, some guards will maintain that the methods used in Kerry were the methods which would be employed by any ordinary uh, group of detectives, any group of ordinary crime detectives. I doubt that. I doubt that very much. It was clear that something was radically wrong here. How was it that an entire family admitted to involvement in the, in the brutal killing of a child, newborn baby, the disposal of that newborn baby, that they simply could not have been involved in? It's as if there were two worlds clashing at that stage. The reality of what had happened in terms of the discovery of the child and still the process of her uh, incarceration pending uh, bail or trial. There was a huge disconnect. The speed of the investigation was remarkable. April 14th, the baby's body is discovered on the White Strand in Carcevine, which is the other end of Kerry. And then May the 2nd, you have a whole family brought before Tralee District Court and being charged, murder charges being preferred. That's fairly remarkable for a, a very <laughs> for an investigation that started from nothing a good catholic family in good standing and suddenly they had confessed to a crime that looked very dodgy major problem i mean collapse of case completely this is a nightmare which the guards have brought upon themselves the question then arose was joanne hayes the mother of both of these babies. And that's where tragedy, in some respects, turned to farce. They are adamant that Joanne Hayes is the mother of both infants. Jerry O'Carroll is on record as having said that he treated Joanne Hayes as if he was a family member. That certainly is not what the Hayes family maintained. I did not raise my voice, not once. I was built there behind the kidneys, and also I was just put lying down the, road, uh, down the ground, and my head was pushed back like that. It might indicate that those confessions aren't all that they're cracked up to be. And then it became a little bit more dramatic. We are fighting for our career, for our families, for our reputation most of all. At the centre of this case was baby John, who was stabbed 28 times. The baby was almost totally forgotten. 